Good morning. Happy New Year. Uh, some of you I haven't seen since, uh, some of you I haven't seen for a year, uh, so I'm glad to see you today. Uh, I, I think it would be good and right and appropriate for me to pray a prayer of blessing over you as we start this new year. Uh, so before I jump into my sermon, let me do that. Uh, give me the privilege, if you would, of, of praying, praying for you. Um, so, so bow with me and let's do that. God, I thank you for, for, for my friends. Um, I thank you for these people that you have given me to love and to serve and to lead. And I thank you for the elders, the good men that you have given me, given us, uh, to lead this church uh, with, with me, shoulder to shoulder. God, we, we're moving into a new year. Um, I have this deep sense, personally, that this is going to be a really good year. Um, I don't even know exactly what that means, God, but I, I just really believe that. So I pray that over, over my friends today. I pray that this would be just an incredibly good year for them. And by good, what I mean by that is that your goodness, God, would show up in their lives. That, that they would be able to take stock each and every day and each and every month as the calendar ticks off this year, that they would be able to take stock each and every day and they would say, you know, like may, maybe today was hard, but God was good. Maybe today was a great day, but, but, but nonetheless... Once again, God was good. I've got to pray that you would show up in their lives in tender ways, in compassionate ways, in provisional ways, in, in surprising ways, in, in new ways. I, I pray for the, for, for, for the gifts of the Spirit in the lives of my friends, that you would give them new gifts and, and, and better gifts. And, and they would, they would see the, the Holy Spirit move in fresh and new ways in their lives. And I pray that for me as well. God, I pray for healing. I pray for physical healing. I pray for wholeness. I pray in the, in the, in the deepest and most, most profound way, I pray for a prosperous new year. For us, individually, for us as a church. May it be, may it be in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I already said Happy New Year. Uh, on, that, uh, uh, on that topic, um, I want to ask you a question. I've been, I've been wondering this ever since uh, Wednesday night, I suppose, uh, based on a conversation that my wife and I had. So here's the question. Did you, you're going to raise your hands, this is an actual question, did you, did you shoot fireworks? Did you go to someone's house and shoot fireworks? Did someone in your family, did a family member shoot fireworks? Were you associated with fireworks uh, this is not a legal question. Were you associated with fireworks in any way uh, in the last two weeks? Raise your hand if you did. Oh my gosh, you're pitiful. Uh, <laughs> and my wife is right. Okay, let me let me ask let me ask let me broaden it a little bit because I mean I, I feel like I know the valley. I'm from here, but but maybe I've been maybe I've been fooling myself. If if you shot off fireworks, gosh, in the last. 12 months, okay? That would include July 4th of that week. Raise your hand. You or anybody in your household. Oh my gosh, what are we, what kind of kids are we raising? Um, okay. Um, so I grew up shooting fireworks, uh, and I just thought everyone shot fireworks. I, I still thought that until this very moment. Uh, but I, I, I did know that that, that my bride-to-be, my, my girlfriend at, at the time when I was a, when I was a teenager, Lydia, uh, who I married, she didn't come from a house that shot fireworks. I remember to this day the first time I took her to my extended family gathering, and, and I realized, like, she doesn't even know the joy of fireworks. And we shot fireworks, 
and then halfway into the evening, the police showed up, and we had, we had to boogie, and uh, that's why I remember. <laughs> that's all true, right? Uh, and that's why I remember introdu the, the first time I introduced my wife to fireworks. Um, another question. Uh, <laughs> the police really did show up. Uh, how, <clears throat> how many of you um, are prone to or actually have already um, made New Year's resolutions. If you've done that, would you, would you raise your hand? And, okay, about as, a few more than shoot fireworks. Okay. Um, okay, the, um, the, um, I have a photo. I'm trying to show, decide if I want to show it to you now or later. The, uh, the idea of, of setting, re uh, making resolutions, making New Year's resolutions. I've been thinking a lot about that lately, and is that a godly thing? Is that a spiritual thing? Is that a, you know, and so I asked my, my family this question, do you know the opposite of, of resolving to do something? And the, the opposite is, is indecisiveness, being being less than, decis less than decisive. Probably most of us in this room today uh, are pro we're probably too indecisive. We, we struggle with setting a course and, 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 and keeping that course. Like we're sitting on the fence and not making any commitments and accomplishing really very little. And I, I'm not trying to be hard on you. I'm just saying that's kind of the, that's kind of the way. Uh, it's kind of the path of least resistance. And so I, I think that that making resolutions, I don't know if January 1st is the right time to make them, maybe every day of your life to be resolute, to, to, to live out uh, what you believe God is calling you to do with, with all your fervor, fervor, with all your strength, with all your might. So I would say make resolutions. Today we are uh, sort of taking inventory. Today we are uh, sort of uh, seeking a deeper level of, of self-awareness as we move into 2020. I think that's a good thing. Not just uh, for the sake of sort of being contemplative, but for the sake of setting a new course. Uh, being more of who we believe God is calling us to be in 2020. Um, so I would ask you as we, as we talk about this, um, are you a person who, who struggles with satisfaction, and, and, and by the way, this is a rhetorical question. You don't, need, don't, don't answer out loud. This, it's a thought-provoking question. Um, do, do you struggle with satisfaction? You know, the, the Caulfields, when it, ta when, when it comes to being satisfied with life, the Caulfields, we, uh, is this on? They're not on. We, uh, we, make, we make like New Year's resolutions. I'm not going to, I put it, put it upside down so that you couldn't, so that you couldn't read it. Uh-oh, oh, hurry up. Uh, all right, but we, we sit down and we, we, we write like what we want to do this year. I don't know if we, we never even call them resolutions. We just say, what do you want to do this year? What do you want to accomplish this year? Uh, and, and this year we broaden it just just, just, just any thoughts about the year? What do you see in your, in your future in the next 12 months? So we as the Caulfields, Lydia and me and our, our five kids, we sit down, our adult children and our children's children, we, we, we do that. Uh, and and it, it really does cause me to think every time how much I personally struggle with satisfaction. Thinking, man, maybe this next year is going to be a better year. Maybe I'll finally get what I want. My question again is, do you struggle with satisfaction? Uh, not getting what you want? Not wanting what you have? And so in a new year, as we struggle with not getting what we want, not wanting what we have, and we struggle with this lack of satisfaction, kind of like a little hole in our hearts, we try and fill that. We try and fill that with uh, exercise, uh, and some of you are guilty of that. Uh, food, and some of you are guilty of that. And hobbies, uh, expensive purchases. And, and I'll be the first to say, to admit, 
that historically I have struggled with satisfaction. Every one of us in this room, we have uh, regrets in life. I want you to, I want you to, I want to give you the freedom to regret, to have regrets. If you don't have any regrets, like I've heard some pompous people say, you're either lying to yourself or, or you're really being super prideful. It's, it's good and right, appropriate. For us, for us to have some regrets in life. And, and, and I certainly do. My biggest regret in life actually revolves around this topic. That I've spent a portion of my adult life. It comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. It, it comes less than it used to. It comes less often than it used to. But my, my biggest regret, I, I, I don't even have to think about it, my biggest regret in life is the days and the periods in my life that I've spent dissatisfied. We, we struggle with that. We, not satisfied with circumstances or salary. Not, not satisfied with relationships or residence, your zip code. Or whatever. We, we struggle with this. We all, every one of us in this room, if you're human, if you're alive, this is true. Every one of us, we have unmet desires. And it causes conflict. Uh, if you take stock, if you look at the conflict in your life, it revolves around unmet desires in your relationships, in your families, in your marriage. Let's take a look at a very relevant scripture passage today. We just scratched the surface on this passage last week. We're going we're gonna to dive in a little deeper today. It comes from James chapter 4. And it begins with this. This question. What causes quarrels... And what causes fights among you? Maybe you've been in a quarrel. Maybe you've been in a fight. Maybe you've been in some sort of power struggle lately. And so James poses this really, really good question. What causes that? He goes on in the next verse and he says this. Is it not this? That your passions... Or at war within you, your your passions, the, that it, the, your longings, your desires. This is actually in the Bible. This is actually James chapter four, New Testament, the Holy Bible. He he asks us today, what is it that causes all of the rage, all of the anger, all of the quarreling, all of the fighting? All the conflict, all the stuff that we say we wish we could rid our lives of. What, is, what causes that personally? What causes that um, uh, socially? What causes that on a national, even a global level? What causes all of this? And then he says, is it not that your passions, your longings, your desires, they're conflicted? As Christians, when we aren't following the teachings of Jesus, we are probably the most conflicted people in the whole world. It would probably be easier uh, it, to, to just be apostates, to, to just not follow Jesus. But when we, when, as Christians, when we say we're going to follow Jesus, but we're not really following the teachings of Jesus, living according to his ethic, then, then, then there, there are uh, conflicts, there, there, are, there are passions that wage war within us. You ever feel that? Like I do. Like, like, like it's an actual conflict in my own spirit. It's not that anybody else has given me, given me, uh, given me a hard time. It's, it's within me. It's a personal conflict. Well, thankfully, he goes on, James, to unpack the, uh, the symptoms, then the actual problem, and then today we're going to talk about the cure as well, the solution. So James goes on, he unpacks what this, this conflict looks like. 
And it's hard. I know it's, it's like looking at yourself in the mirror, but let's just read together and f- afford one another a lot of grace. But here's what it looks like. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You're like, well, I've never murdered anybody, but remember, Jesus said when you hate somebody in your heart, it's like you murder. So, uh, literally or figuratively, um, you desire and do not have, so you murder, or you, you hate in your heart, you, you kill them in, 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 in your mind. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You, you covet means you, you want. You, you want. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. But then you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. Because you ask to, you ask to spend it on, on your passions, your longings, your desires. And then he goes so far as to say, you adulterous people. What, a, what an odd choice of words. You, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Enmity. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Hard words, but, but the word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So have you ever had someone say to you, or have you ever, had, have you ever said to someone else, why can't you just be happy with what you have? Hmm. What's most painful is when I, when I say that to myself silently. Randy, why can't you just be happy with what you have? And, and James, in today's passage, he says, here, here are the symptoms. In case you're wondering, is that me? Is he talking about me? Here are the symptoms. See if you can relate. You long for what you don't have. Longing and desire, by the way, is not the problem. That's why I've called this merely the symptom. Because some of us, we have, been, we, we have received misinformation. We believe that the Bible, uh, and that, that God's desire for us is that we would lay down our longings, that our, our desires would be quieted. Uh, not at all. Longing, desire, it's not the problem. It's merely the symptom in fact, you were made to long for and desire satisfaction. That's how God made you. God made you with this, 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 this desire, this longing to be satisfied. It's why Jesus in the Beatitudes says, blessed are you if. What does Jesus know? Jesus knows that we want to be blessed. We want to be happy. We want to be satisfied. Any religion, uh, any religious teaching that, that says that, that you, you, aren't, you aren't made to be satisfied, there is no satisfaction to be found, that, that's a lie. That is not the gospel. The good news of Jesus is that, that he says, here is how you will obtain blessing. Here is how you will find satisfaction both now and for eternity. The symptom is this longing and this passion, but here, the, here's the, here the, the key is for what you don't have. You desire what you don't have, like a kid who missed out on Christmas morning. You ask, James says, but when you ask, you've got really unhealthy motives, meaning not good for you sort of motives. You think it's good for you, but it's not. Uh, and then he goes on and says that we're like, like adulterers. So, so the symptom is you long for what you can't have. But the problem, he says, isn't actually your longing, your desiring. His problem, it, it's, a, it's kind of a poetic phrase. We need to figure out what this means. He says, your problem is, he says, friendship with the world. 
And he says, in fact, friendship with the world means that you are at enmity, that you have enmity toward God, that you are an enemy of, of God. Now, is James saying, don't have friends who are in the world, don't be culturally savvy, don't have friends who don't go to church? No, he's not saying that at all. Th that is not what he means by friendship with the world. I have, I have lots of, of casual and somewhat deep friendships with people who don't go to church, who are agnostic or an <clears throat> atheist or something else. I embrace that. I really enjoy people that are, that are <clears throat> still seeking, still trying to figure it out. I encourage you in 2020 to be more engaged with the world, more engaged uh, culturally, more engaged with Brownsville. That's not the point. <clears throat> but the problem is, nonetheless, friendship with the world. That's what James, how James describes it. Um, like this, he says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So in this passage, there, there are really like two ways, two paths that you can go down as a Christ follower. One is you can go down the path of being a, a friend of the world. The other path that you can go down is being a friend of God. But according to James, in this passage, you cannot do both. You, they're mutually exclusive. You go down one path leading one direction, or you go down another path leading 180 degrees, a, a completely different direction, north and south, or east and west, but they, they don't meet. Mutually exclusive, one or the other. So how do we know which path we're on? I mean, if I'm sitting out there where you are, that's... That's like, that's like a, the question that is being begged. Wait, wait am, I, am I on the path towards friendship with the world? Am I on a path towards friendship with God? And I would just ask, um, gently, graciously, I would just ask, does the phrase passions at war in your heart, does that ring true with you? Does that sound familiar to you, this phrase, um, passions at war in your heart, then we don't need to deny it at that point. We just need to say, you know, yeah, that, that, that's me, and therefore, this is my struggle. Um, this is the tension. Uh, I'm a, I have a friendship with the world, and, and therefore, I'm not going to be able to be a friend of God according to this metric, according to this passage. So, allow me to briefly unpack what I believe James means by friendship with the world. What that looks like from James 4. I've, I've dug through the, uh, the, this passage, what I just read to you, calling us adulterers and, and saying that we have passions and, and we ask for unhealthy stuff. And, and I've kind of broken it down, not kind of, I've broken it down into, I believe, five categories. Friendship with the world looks like this. Number one, thinking on, tri on the trivial. We all do this from time, but, but when this takes over, Thinking on the trivial. That means things that are of little value, things that are of, of little importance, unimportant things. There's a window into my heart. Um, sometimes when I'm really struggling with this, um, uh, thinking on trivial things, and I've noticed that it kind of coincides with periods in my life where I'm really fatigued. But, 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 um, but sometimes when I'm struggling with this, thinking on the trivial, which really is a symptom or a, uh, evidence that I'm, I'm a friend of the world. Thinking on trivial things, uh, here's what it looks like. I have my MacBook Pro open, I'm at the dining room table, and somebody comes in the room, and I feel like I need to switch screens. I feel like I need to close the computer. You're like, man, what's Pastor Randy looking at? Well, no, it's like I'm looking at like motorcycle helmets, or I'm I'm looking at like like some workout routine online, but it's just dumb stuff. It's just unimportant stuff. And I realize that when I'm like, man, I'm a little embarrassed for my family to see that like like 30 minutes has passed and I'm still looking at motorcycle helmets. Like how how trivial. 
how important. Something that I resolved to do this year is to play at the trivial, but not work at the trivial. Do you do that? Do you, do you like work hard at the trivial and then maybe simply piddle or play at the significant? What that does is that creates passions within us that make no sense. Wage war against us. I even know, like, man, like this, this desire, it's so trivial that, that it's, it's, a con, it's a conflict within me. Friendship with the world, it, it, it looks like thinking on the trivial. The second thing it looks like is thinking on the carnal. That's a, like a big big uh, King James word, right? Um, but, but what it really means is not looking at the dirty. It could. Not looking at the nasty. It could mean that. But what it really means is, is just spending much of your time thinking on your physical needs, on your physical activities, uh, what you're going to do, uh, what you're going to need. And, and again, those, those are things that, that even Jesus said, look, the Lord himself, God, he created you. He knows what you need. Jesus told it. He didn't say, look, like, buffet the body, uh, wartime mentality, uh, you don't need stuff. Like, that, that's not what Jesus said. That's what some people say, but that's not what Jesus said. Yeah. Jesus said, your heavenly Father knows what you need. He feeds the birds. He feeds the flowers. You think he's not going to feed you? But friendship with the world looks like me saying, God's not going to feed me. I sure better feed myself. God's not going to put clothes on my kid's back. I got to do it myself. It's, it's thinking on the carnal all the time. And just being consumed with what car are we going to get next? What house are we going to build next? It's thinking on the physical. The third, the third um, evidence or the third idea in this passage that we looked at is this. It's thinking on self-promotion. Walking through the door and sizing the room up and just always thinking like, how am I going to look in this scenario? Everything I say, it's, it's about how how you will perceive me. And so I'm never really just speaking the truth. I'm speaking some sort of filtered truth in order to shape uh, how you think about me. And maybe even to tear somebody else down because it's all about, about me and what makes a me is self-promotion all the time. The others are sort of iterations of this. It's thinking on money. We all need money. You need money. The church needs money. We all need money, but, but just thinking all the time on kind of what I just said, that we all need money. Friendship with the world, a fifth idea would be thinking on vengeance. Some of us in this room, that's what drives us this day. Paybacks, get-evens, vengeance. Maybe you've never killed anybody, but in your mind you have. And James says, if this is us, if this is me, if I'm the guy that's thinking on the trivial all the time, working at the trivial, just playing at the significant, if I'm the guy who's, who's thinking on the carnal all the time and self-promoting and making money and making more money and, and thinking on who hurt me and how I'm going to one day pay him back, James warns, you are setting yourself up to be an enemy of the Lord God himself. That is what a friendship with the world looks like. And in a sense, if I can just admit this for all of us, in a sense, we can't help ourselves. We can't just hold our breath and try harder. In 2020, I'm not going to do anything on that list. Yeah, good luck. You might make it to lunch, right? Um... Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like, man, I am powerless. I am, I am powerless to do 
any list, to, to accomplish any list, especially some religious list that looks good on Sunday but doesn't play well on Monday, the fact is, within every one of us, uh, is this little, f this little factory where, where things are built. Within every one of us, there is this, this factory. Uh, it's our heart, uh, figuratively speaking. Um, this factory where little idols are made. And by idols, I mean the objects that we worship. Within every one of us, there's this little factory, this little idol factory, where we build objects of worship, where we place them, this little throne. Because every one of us in this room, every human being, in fact, is made to worship. And, and boy, do we worship hard. We worship every second of every day of our lives. You are a worshiper. And there's this little throne, this little factory in which you build idols where you, where you place the, the most significant. And so really the question is not whether or not you are a worshiper, but, but who or what do you worship? It's all born out of what we talked about a while ago. All born out of our desires, our, our passions. I'll give you just a quick, quick lesson on what worship actually looks like. Look for two words as we read this passage. One is glory, and the other is sacrifice. Romans, the end of Romans 11, going into Romans 12. It says this, for, for everything comes from him, the Lord God. Everything comes from him. Everything, everything exists by his power, and everything is intended for his glory. If, if you want to understand the ethic of God, the, the, the highest, the highest um, passion uh, of, of God, what his intended purposes really revolve around, this verse is a good one to go to. Everything comes from God, everything exists by his power, and everything is intended for his glory. All glory to him Forever. Remember, I told you to look for the word glory and look for the word sacrifice. We're talking about worship. What is worship? Glory and sacrifice. Moving into verse, to, to chapter 12, remember, in the original, in the original uh, writing, there wouldn't have been verses and chapter markings and all that. There would have been paragraphs. But go on. And so, in other words, based on what I just said, Paul said, based on what I just said, that everything comes from him, everything exists for him, or by his power, intended for his glory, glory to him forever. And so, based on that, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your, your bodies, figuratively bodies, to God because of all he has done for you. Let them, that is, your bodies, and what he really means is just every aspect of who you are, not just your physical being, but every, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship God. Okay, so, so we have a kind of a definition uh, or a diagram, maybe it would be a better word, of worship here. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that in just a minute. But why, by way of review, let's remember... The symptom, you long for what you cannot have. The problem, friendship with the world. And we're about to look at the cure. About to look at the cure, but, 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 but I want to unpack this now. What is worship? What is, what is Paul in the book of Romans saying? Where worship is glory and sacrifice. Something to which you give glory and something for which you will sacrifice. I'll give you several examples. Um... In the mid-80s, I was like 16, I was 16, and I realized for the first time, I may have a shot with Lydia Horn, right? Like, I didn't, I didn't think I would ever have a shot with Miss Lydia Horn, but, like, I realized she might go out with me. And I would see her on Sunday mornings, and I would say, she is glorious, like, Glory be, I would love to go out with her. 
And at some point, at some point, it got it got to the level where I said, where I said, you know what? I I would for a lifetime, I would be willing to to sacrifice to be with her. It's really been no sacrifice, but 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 each and every day, we all in marriage, we make little sacrifices. But that's what worship looks like. Not that we should worship our wives, but that's kind of a picture. You, you say something is glorious to the degree that I am willing to sacrifice for that. Have you ever noticed that, that we run out of, like maybe the church asks you for something, or maybe some in some, let's just stick with the church. Maybe the church asks you for something, for your time, for your money, for your, uh, for your attention. You're like, man, I am just, I'm just out, man. I'm just, I've just run out. Of energy. Maybe you're a school teacher. You're about to go back to school, and maybe the kids, you know, you're just like, I am on, I am on empty. I just have nothing less to give. But have you ever noticed? Then something might come up, and you're like, you know what? I could sacrifice more for that because that's glorious. Like I thought I was on empty, but I, I that, that is glorious, and I am willing to sacrifice for that. It's 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 intriguing to me how we at times feel like we've come to the end. We've got nothing left to give. But then something comes up that is so worthy, uh, so, um, <clears throat> so, does, so uh, captures our attention to the point that we, we got more to give. That, my friends, is worship. And we have these little idol factories in our hearts. And we're worshiping. It's just a matter of who or what are you worshiping. I was looking at, we have a motorcycle theme today. I was looking at, I was looking at a motorcycle the other day. There's a Honda Africa Twin. If you're a motorcycle guy, you know what that is. And I was like, like, man, that is, that is a glorious bike. But you know what? I'm not willing to sacrifice for that. I think it's like 13, 14 grand. I don't have that money. I'm not willing to cough that kind of money up or take a loan. So I'm like, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's glorious. But I'm, I'm not willing to sacrifice for that. So I don't have one. Um... So it's another sort of uh, value system decision. Like, I'm not going to worship that. The problem, friendship with the world. Here's the cure. Rethinking your values. Living for a new king, living for a new kingdom. What a great season to do that. What a great season to say, you know what, I'm going to play at the trivial. That's okay, I'm going to play at the trivial. But I'm going to work at the significant. A new king, a new kingdom, a king who really does have my best interests at heart, a, a, a king who, who really does want to meet my needs, who plans to give me all that I need, a, a king who can satisfy me, and a, and a new kingdom that will be for eternity. This is what Paul is inviting us to, glory and sacrifice. Those are the operative words, glory and sacrifice. So, so today is the... The day of self-awareness. The more I live in this realm, I want you to know the more satisfied and the happier I am. I'm not inviting you to do something that's going to be good for the church or, or going to be good for Jesus, although those things will be true. I, I'm inviting you to something that is good for you. I'm just telling you, as now an older man, I'm just telling you that I have gone through this. The more I think on, on golf and, and motorcycle helmets and my next vacation and a new shotgun, it is weird. It is weird. But the more I think on that stuff, the less satisfied I am. The more dissatisfaction I struggle with. That's what's so self-destructive about, about our friendship with the world. It doesn't even accomplish what we want it to accomplish. It doesn't even bring satisfaction. It doesn't even meet our desires. I'm not asking you to consider some sacrifice to Jesus that would do you no good. That would make you miserable. So... I'm not going to put anything else up on the screen. Let's go back to this one. Um, what I want to do is give you
some thoughts on how you can do this in 2020. Because if I'm you, I'm like, that sounds good, but how in the world do I do that? Number one, and this is another sermon. In fact, it's a series of sermons that I preached in 2019. But number one, first and foremost, you have to pray that the Holy Spirit would move into your heart and would shape and mold you as, as a person. Again, going back to what I said earlier, you trying to hold your breath and follow a set of rules, just, that just ain't going to work. But some practical thoughts on how can I be a friend of God? How can I evaluate and, and, and reset my, my value system? How can I do that? So, so that I can live for a new king, live for a new kingdom. And so, so uh, three ideas. Yea, verily, four, actually. Um, four ideas. And these are all, I think, on my list of what I want to do more of this year, more of who I really want to be this year. One is, I invite you to be regularly engaged in prayer. Uh, to, 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 to regularly go on walks and pray. Sit in a quiet room and, and pray. Like, well, Randy, I don't even know what, the, what I want to say. Well, that's okay. Just sit there and just say, God, would you speak to me? If you want to root out, if you want to root out the, 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 the false motives and, and, and the worldly the friendship with the world sort of stuff that we've been talking about today, I invite you, first and foremost, just to sit at the feet of our Lord and say, God, I don't even know what I'm doing here, but would you work in my heart? Number two, well, let, me, let me stop there. I, 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 preached a, I preached a sermon series a few months ago, and I said this, I believe that we are largely a prayerless people. That ought not be. In your life, don't answer out loud, but are you, are you largely a prayerless person? Have you ever contemplated the power and the presence of the Lord that might show up if you, if you actually engage in prayer in 2020? Don't just trifle at it, but, but take it seriously. The second practical idea I have is this. The first is regularly engage in prayer. Number two, regularly engage in scripture reading. I... I, over the last several years, some years I have read through the entire Bible and other years I, I don't. I'm like, I'm just going to read books. I'm just going to read what I want. I, it's, it's just pretty, pretty straightforward for me. On those years, I read less of the Bible. When I don't, start off January with, I'm going to do this. So this year, I've gone back to the Daily Walk Bible. It's NLT. It's easy to read. It's, it's broken out into... 365 days, so you get February 29th off this year. Um, and I'm going to do that. That's, this is a leap year. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read that. You can do whatever, however you want, but regularly engage in Scripture reading. Number three, um, I'm going to invite you to regularly wage war on sin in your life. What does that mean, Randy? I want you to make sin your enemy. What does that mean, Randy? Look at, I, I am going to actually show you one more passage. For the mind that is set on the flesh, that's this friendship with the world, is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. It, it, indeed, it, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh, they cannot please God. Another passage, so, so brethren and sistren, whatever the word is, brothers and sisters, we are under no obligation, or we, I'm sorry, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. You don't have to be a friend. If you, if you tell yourself, I just can't help myself, you are lying to yourself if you're a Christ follower. The Holy Spirit lives in you. You are not powerless. You do have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. You're not under obligation to be a friend of the world. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die some passages says you will die. In other words, it will kill you. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What is it talking about? It's talking about waging war on sin. That's what I'm asking, inviting you to do this year as we're trying to reorient our value systems. Wage war. In other words, embarrass your sin to death. Shame your sin to death. Don't hide it. Protect it. Keep it anonymous. Like, I'm not going to tell anybody about this. I'm going to keep it all private. I'm going to, I'm going to coddle it. 
what are you doing? You're, you're just, you're, you're, you're playing with your sin. You're hiding it. You're admitting it to no one because you want to keep, you want to continue it in 2020. Some of you in this room right now, there's sin, there's something in your life that's wicked, that is, that is killing you, and you're, you're keeping it anonymous, you're protecting it, you're coddling it, you're hiding it. <clears throat> you have to bring it out into the light. You have to shed light on it. You have to kill it. You have to wage war. You have to be serious. You don't trifle with it anymore. You have to be serious about killing it, which leads to our last... How do we do that? At least this last idea. I'm not putting up these ideas. I'm just reading them. Regularly seeking help from Christian friends. Being engaged in community. Some of you, you, you come here, but you're not engaged. You're free. You don't find friendships with Christians. You maybe don't have any friends. I know that of some. You have no friends. You're not engaged in community. You can't embarrass your sin to death if you have no compadres, no, 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 uh, <clears throat> no brother or sister that you can, that you can share life with. For some of you, that's the, that's the beginning to all this is, I'm not going to live in anonymity and privacy anymore. I'm going to engage in community. So again, and then we're going to pray. How do I do this, Randy? I invite you, invite you to four steps. One is regularly engage in prayer. Number two, regularly engage in scripture reading. Number three, regularly wage war on your own personal sin. Shame it to death. Number four, a good way of doing that is regularly seeking help from Christian friends. Hey brother, I, like, I'm struggling with this man. Can you help me? I don't want you to tell anybody else, but can you help me? And a dear friend will do that. Here's to 2020. I think it's going to be our best year yet. Join me in prayer, please.